Hi, everybody. Uh, thanks for joining us. Um, it's officially March. It's officially spring. Um, and this is the Wild Ones Greater Cleveland Chapter uh, monthly meeting. Let me see. Oh, Kathleen said she saw it in an email notice. Okay, that's good. That's good. All right. Our agenda for today, we're going to have a quick welcome. Um, our education topic that Jennifer, do you go by Jen? I see your, okay. Um, Jen's going to talk with us from ODNR about Old Women Creek. Uh, we're going to do our chapter updates, um, talk about uh, a few past events we did and some upcoming events. Um, and then we're going to have a discussion. At the end, um, we have Robin here. Um, we're going to talk about the Nature in My Backyard program um, that's with the Audubon Society of Greater Cleveland, um, partnering with Shaker Lakes Garden Club. Uh, so our mission here at Wild Ones is to promote native landscapes through education, advocacy, and collaborative action. Um, so what's blooming right now? Probably not much. Uh, there's been a lot of snow and blizzards. <laughs> uh lately so i feel like everything started to sprout and then it was like oh no and just like sucked back in so um one of the things you might be seeing if it does stay a little bit warmer which i don't think it's going to is going to be these lovely spring beauty uh buds um and usually i i usually see them around my neighborhood like in the grass you know in people's yards coming up which is very exciting um I'm also going to open the floor to anyone who's on this call, who's a new member, if you want to say hi, um, you know, you're not obligated to, but uh, if you feel so inclined, we're very casual here, as you can tell by uh, our user error of how Zoom works, apparently, but um, if anyone wants to say hi and say where you're from, uh, Abby, I see you. I met you Tuesday night. Do you want to do you want to give a quick hello? Hello. <laughs> Hi, I'm I'm glad to be here. I'm looking forward to it. Good. Thank you. Anybody else want to give a little a little shout? Anything on anybody's yeah. mind? Hi. Hi, I'm also new. I'm Sarah. Nice to meet everyone. Happy to be nice here. To Yay. We're happy you're here too. All right. All right. Um, we're going to have our educational topic now. Jen, do you have slides and everything? I do, yeah. Okay. You should have availability to share, but I need to stop first. So <laughs> there you go. You should be able to. Okay, I am so sorry. Of course, I gave my dog a bone right before this, and I don't know if it was somebody else's voice or what, but he's now uh, decided to uh, make himself known. Hopefully, he goes back That's, to that bone. <laughs> we're very animal friendly here, so don't worry. <laughs> All right, so everyone can see those slides, hopefully. Okay. Um, so my name is Jennifer Buhite. I'm the education coordinator at Oldman Creek, which is a national estuarine research reserve. That's a mouthful. I'll explain it a little more in a second. There is my email if anyone um, wants to get a hold of me uh, later. Um, that is how you can do it. So the National Estuarine Research Reserve System is through our federal partner, which is uh, NOAA, the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration. Um, we are a state and federal partnership throughout this system. Um, obviously, our state partner is the Ohio Department of Natural Resources, um, and we're located at Oldman Creek. So there are 30 National Estuarine Research Reserves. Um, I tend to shorten it to National Estuaries. 
um, throughout the country. Um, and you can see that most of them are in the lower 48, but there's three found outside of the lower 48. And then if you zoom in a little more, you can see that there are two, just two, um, in the Great Lakes. So we have been a national estuary since 1980 at Oldman Creek, and Lake Superior came online uh, in 2010. I am so sorry. Um, so the goal of this system is to protect um, and educate about our national estuaries. Um, so an estuary is where two chemically distinct bodies of water meet and mix. So for us, it's Old Woman Creek and Lake Erie. For all the other ones, you can see most of them are freshwater mixing with salt water. Here in the Great Lakes, our uh, rivers are more have more uh, ions. Um, they're more conductive than um, our our Great Lakes that they're entering into. Um, let's see here. So on the flip side for the state, we are a state nature preserve. Um, and this partnership, we became a state nature preserve in 1979 with the intention of becoming a national estuary. Before that, it was privately owned land, um, a lot of it farmland. Um, this is our trail map. Um, we do have 573 acres, but we keep most of the human activity um, kind of localized to around our visitor center. And that is so that the rest of our acreage can be set aside for preservation uh, and uh, research if needed. Uh, we also have, you'll see in the upper left corner there, a beach location, uh, beach side location. Uh, it is a strolling beach, not a swimming beach, um, because it's a state nature preserve, but it's a great place to um, see the lake, uh, see Oldman Creek uh, entering, um, and I'm going to talk a little bit more about the functionality of that system um, and why it's so unique, um, and those unique properties were why it was chosen to become this national estuary um, in Ohio. So this is what it looks like um, right now. Um, not quite that green yet, but almost. But you'll see that um, Olderman Creek uh, is coming in from that wetland and entering Lake Erie um, through the beach. We call that a barrier beach uh, because sometimes it fills in and it looks like that, where the sand goes all the way across the mouth. And that what we call opening and closing happens naturally, um, and I'll show you an animation of how that works, um, but it's naturally functioning. Um, it's never been altered. It's never been a marina. It's never been channelized. Um, there's a, was a little bit of channelization when I put in the railroad there um, at the towards the bottom of the screen, um, but the mouth has stayed um, as is, and that uh, opening and closing of the mouth um, really helps us study the water quality and helps um, our natural wetland do its ultimate best job that it can do. So I heard that you guys have heard about wetlands before, so that's good. So I won't spend a ton of time um, just going over. Um, we know that wetlands are the kidneys of, um, of nature, so they do filtration for us. They help with floodwaters, they provide great habitat, and they provide a place for us to recreate. This is a picture of one of um, my teacher workshops. So spring and fall, we do K through 12 education, do public programming all year. And then in the summer, I turn my focus to teacher professional development um, so that teachers can get out um, in the reserve learning the science so they can take that back to the classroom. So this is an animation of how our barrier beach system works. When we get precipitation, it flows downhill, thank you gravity, um, to a low spot, uh, which is for us typically a body of water. There's Oldman Creek. You can see at the top, the barrier beach goes across the mouth. So 
as that water is filling in, going downhill, it'll fill in those flood zones and it'll hang out until the water pressure gets high enough and it'll bust through that barrier beach. The important stuff for water quality um, happens while that barrier beach is closed. So the more time that barrier beach is closed and that water is just hanging out, the more time our plants um, have time to filter out those nutrients and really be that kidney. Um, in this picture, you can kind of see all the brown is Olderman Creek, but we're clearly surrounded by agriculture. Um, so we test the water down here as it's coming into the system and up here as it's leaving. And we can prove that the wetlands do in fact filter out um, around 80% of phosphates um, and I think 90% of nitrates. So they do do a really effective job at what they're doing. Um, and those flood areas, you know, those plants and animals are adapted to living in those really dynamic water level um, system that we have. So next is just some pretty pictures of things that you may find if you came and visited Oldman Creek or may see um, if you were visiting. Um, so we are very well known for the American Lotus. Um, you guys seem like plant people. So you obviously know that the American Lotus as you're driving by as an aquatic flower that is up off the surface of the water, both um, most of the time with the bloom and those, um, I call them satellite dish leaves. So they they kind of follow the sun sometimes. Um, they're also hydrophobic, so they're waterproof. If you see one floating across the water, usually um, a muskrat is taking it back to um, its hut uh, for dinner um, later on, um, but they fill the estuary um, <clears throat> in the mid to late summer um, and provide that great bloom. They're also, most of this plant is edible, um, so it was a very important species um, for the indigenous populations that lived there before us. Water lily, uh, floating on the surface. When you see them side by side like that, they don't look so similar, but um, a lot of people do confuse them. So plants are the leaves and the waters floating on the surface versus the lotus, which are up off of the surface. Um, my favorite of our plants is um, marshmallow, so our native uh, Great Lakes hibiscus. Again, another highly edible plant, um, this beautiful pink flower that we'll see. Uh, and I just love going out in July and kind of seeing those popping along the banks. Also a very good treat for our local deer population. We do get a lot of birds. We are part of the that spring migration. We don't get quite as many birds or people as McGee Marsh, um, but we do get some good birds. And we have a lot of um, nature photographers that will share their work with me. Um, Kit, who you can see his name in the corner there, always sends me some good egret pictures. I call them the, the Ziggy Stardust bird because the male, this is a male here, uh, spring breeding color gets those neon um, eye patches, um, and then they have some fun flare breeding feathers in the back. Um, so the great egret, the great blue heron um, is ubiquitous all around, but still a beauty to watch. Uh, my other favorite, trumpeter swans. So we've been seeing a lot of those lately um, passing through. There is an invasive swan called the mute swan. It looks very similar, except it has an orange bill. Um, these guys are not nearly as aggressive as the mute swans. Uh, so um, if you see the mute swan, I would recommend calling your wildlife officer um, as they prevent our native swans from, um, from breeding. Um, and they can be quite aggressive to humans and dogs and other things. The kingfisher um, is a fun little bird. Obviously it, it's a water bird, it eats fish. Um, this is the belted kingfisher, although this one doesn't have its belt uh, nearly quite that identifiable, but um, they fly by and they make this really fast, loud call. So they're always fun to see when you're out paddling on the water. Probably at Oldman Creek, the most common uh, waterfowl we have is the wood duck. Um, the male is on the left, very fancy, um, and the female much more muted. Um, she has a little blue patch. It's hard to see in this picture right there. Um, small, 
have a little squeak when they fly away. Um, but we have quite a big breeding population of, of these guys on our estuary. And of course, bald eagles. Um, we get a lot of people that come to see bald eagles at Old Woman Creek. If you want to come see bald eagles, you can almost always see one any day. But if you really want to see a lot, I'd suggest coming at the coldest day you can think of in January or February. And you can see upwards of 40. They just hunker down in the trees. There's no leaves on the trees, so you can just look around and count the white heads um, that you see sitting out and about. But for people like our nature photographers who have those huge lenses on these great cameras, you can get beautiful photographs like this. For people who like furry friends instead of feathered friends, so we do have some trail cameras out on the property. Um, deer and the next animal you'll see have very good hearing, so they often hear the, the camera clicking, so we get a lot of selfies of these guys. Um, and the structure in the back area, this is our beaver lodge. And what we discovered with these trail cameras is that the beaver lodge is kind of town square. It's the center of town. Everybody visits um, and everybody's kind of checking things out. So also visiting the beaver lodge, you can see our coyote friend here. Again, good ears, heard the camera and turn to look. Um, it's a real healthy specimen. I don't see coyotes very often. Um, they have plenty of, of room to roam. I just typically see evidence of coyotes. Um, this tree, this is the best picture you're going to see, but this tree over here on the left, um, we put a trail camera on that, and that night the beavers chewed that tree down. <laughs> we had to relocate our trail camera, and they were like, no, thank you for that one. So in this picture, you can see that same tree. Um, but if you notice right here, if you can see my mouse in the lower right corner of each picture, that is a river otter. Um, so river otter and, and mink, um, their cousin are in the weasel family. Um, you can see they have that like cylindrical body shape um, and they're checking out to see if there are any um, little furry things they can eat around the beaver lodge. It's the only time we see river otter, or even really the only time I see evidence of them is when I see them around the beaver lodge in these trail cameras. And there's a baby beaver. Um, so each year our beavers have um, two to three kits. The kits will stay with the parents for two years, um, but the parents will have a litter every year. Um, and so can get kind of crowded in there. After their second year, they have to head out into the world and figure out um, how they're gonna survive. They will have learned some things. This is dad. Um, dad is in charge of maintaining the lodge um, and that um, adage, busy as a beaver is very accurate. So about midnight every night he goes out and you can see he has his little path there. This is him carrying some mud up and over the top and then head him back out into the estuary to get more supplies, be them sticks or mud, um, what have you. We've noticed that they also like have channelized the area around their lodge because they know that it's easier to float a tree than to drag a tree. Um, so what they've determined is that beavers are second only to humans for their ability to engineer their environment. Um, they can be considered pest like um, if you have property that you don't want flooded. Um, at Oldman Creek, they're not trying to dam it. Our, we have a lazy river. It doesn't run nearly fast enough for them to bother. They really just don't like the sound of running water. Um, but the wetlands that they can create do help with water quality um, because wetlands help with water quality. Um, so these are our amphibians that you can find and just like the flowers that started blooming, our amphibians started calling. Uh, so uh, in the upper right, we have green frog. You can tell because he's got this line that goes back this ridge. This is our bullfrog. Spring peepers are the ones you've probably heard already. And then salamanders. Um, some salamanders may have started to run, but it's probably gotten cold enough where they turned back around and went 
back under their, their logs and into the substrate. Sorry if anyone is uh, reptile averse. Um, so um, top left, we have the Midland Painted Turtle. Um, then we have a snapping turtle. That snapping turtle made its way into one of my fish nets overnight, um, got a free breakfast, um, ate some of my data points, um, and then I had to free it and use that stick that's in its mouth to um, encourage it to get on its way. Uh, and then this is the eastern fox snake. Um, at Oldman Creek, you can find your typical garter snakes um, and uh common water snakes, and you can find the eastern fox snake, which is a wetland-specific um, species, and uh, it is only found in five counties now in Ohio. Um, it is threatened mostly because of habitat loss, um, so Erie County and west along the lake is where you can find this very docile but very important um, snake species. So if you want to come visit us, um, we have paddling tours in the summertime. Like I said, we have a beach that you can visit. We have hiking tours. Our trails are open every day, sun up to sun down. Um, we do have um, public programming. We have a visitor center. These two QR codes um, will get you to our website and our Facebook page where all of our events are posted on both. Um, so if anyone is interested in visiting or wants to know what kind of programming we're offering, those things can be found there. Also on our website, you can download our calendar for the entire year. And I think that is the end. I think I was, hopefully that's a good time for time. It's a great time. We started a little bit late, so you're, you're great. Um, thank you so much. I know, yes. uh, the Thank you. comment about the bald eagles is a really good, like, secret tip to know. Granted, going outside and yes. walking around on the coldest day of the winter does not sound like much fun, but obviously it would have great reward. Um, how often do you do your paddling tours during the summer? Is that like an everyday thing or is that it's a once certain a days? Yeah, it's a once a week thing. So we alternate between one week, it'll be Wednesday night, and then the next week, it'll be Saturday morning. So we try to offer it, you know, when people can come. Um, and um, you just have to call and register. All of our programming is free. Um, there's no fees to get on the property. There's no free fees to do any of our programs. Um, just have to call and register. That's great. Did anybody have any questions for Jen? Yeah, I have a question, Jen. Um, so as far as your staff and the wildlife, like what what do you what all do you do to to manage that? Or like I heard you talk about the mute swan. Do you um, yeah. um, take so against those or what do you do? <laughs> officially against the mute swans, the Division of Wildlife, so that is a sister agency to us, does have a removal program. Typically that's gonna be a wildlife officer. Um we do um, species monitoring. So we pick um, specific groups of animals. So as an example, we have secretive marsh birds um, or our frog watch. Um, and we have volunteers that will come out and listen for calls of birds and frogs, and then write down you know, what species they hear. We also have salamanders. And we have a pair of volunteers that monitor our bald eagle nest. Um, so we have a, a relatively small staff, like six people. Um, and so we rely heavily on our volunteer citizen science folks um, to help us. Um, we also, we do a lot of, well, we can, because it's a state nature preserve, we can only have native plants. Um, so now that spring is sprung, um, we're going to do some invasive species removals. Uh, we have both terrestrial and aquatic species that we try to manage um, for invasive uh, removals. That was going to be my question. Do you find that you have a lot or do you do invasive removal kind of like every every season? Yes, um, we we have focused most of our energy in the past on the aquatic arena. So when I first started in 2013, 
Um, when I looked out at the wetland, it was almost all Phragmites. Um, and then we really did some both um, chemical and mechanical removal of, I'm sorry. Um, both mechanical and chemical removal of Phragmites. Um, and then um, water levels rising in um, 2019 and 2020 um, really helped us keep Phragmites at bay. Um, we also found in 2017, we have um, a European frogbit, which is um, a very small floating plant um, that um, we can remove best mechanically. It is very resistant to the different um, chemicals um, that the department uh, or the Division of Natural Areas and Preserves have tried. Um, so we do have every other week, every other Saturday in the summer, we have um, a volunteer removal where if you want to come paddle, um, the canoes and the kayaks are free. We just hand you a bucket um, show you the plant, um, and we have these little like extendo rakes. Um, and so from your boat, they're they're free floating plants. So you just rake it over and dump it in your bucket. And then we um, compost them far enough away where they won't be able to like blow back in um, to the, to the. That's uh, that sounds pretty exciting to be honest. It does. <laughs> it's lovely. And it it's so like, um, I always tell people it's kind of addictive because once you start grabbing it like if you see one that you just can't reach you have to like turn around and go get it because you just like don't want to leave one behind um so and then um this year we're going to do a garlic mustard pull as one of our terrestrial things um coming up in april um do you know the date for, for that i'm sorry to interrupt but go ahead do you know a date for the invasive removal the garlic mustard removal it's okay if you don't. That's okay. I don't, but I can email. email Sherry and she can put it out to your group yeah. um, if you want. And it should be on our calendars um, in different areas. I want to say it's it's either late April or early May, but it's got to be April because we want to get it before it um, goes to seed. So, yeah. Um, um, but uh, a lot of our terrestrial management really falls under the natural areas and preserve staff and they do use um, some, um, some herbicides for that. Cause it can, they just, they go so fast, you know, autumn olive and privet and <clears throat> some of those kind of big ones, multi-floor rows, which I do not like to battle <laughs> physically. So. Well, that's good to know. Cause I know we have a number of our members that really like to get hands-on. And so to know that there are things like uh, removals or um, if you have garden plantings or tree plantings or things like that, um, you know, it'd be great for our members to, you know, co connect on Facebook or on, on the website, as you mentioned earlier, and, you know, get your fix. If yeah. You and if any, <laughs> if anyone wants more information, shoot me an email and yeah, I can um, get you hooked up if you want to want to come out and, you know, kill some unwanted plants. <laughs> Jen, can you put your website in the chat for us so we can all um, yes. have access to that? That would be wonderful. Yes. Um, it isn't, I'm going to take a second and. Um, You're fine. Uh, take your time. Okay. <laughs> um, does anybody else have any questions or anything to add? It's been great. I was going to ask about invasives too. So I'm glad uh, we chatted about that. So. All right. I think well, it's thanks, a good Jen. exercise too, and knowing you know to join you to help. <laughs> now my dogs are starting. Uh, <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> yeah, I was gonna say you know like weeding at my house always is almost like therapeutic because you don't have to think about yeah. anything else. You're just mm -hmm. like sitting there pulling. So I imagine like sitting on a kayak and like having the water. <laughs> like it would just be like really relaxing. Yeah. That's yeah. way better than, you know, just the normal terrestrial removal, yeah. like, whoa, mm -hmm. you can get in the paddle and chill and yep. take out the beauty, you know, and then kill some plants, you know. <laughs> kill we some can make plants. it a wild ones field trip. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. Okay, carpool. Oop, did I? Oh. Did All somebody right. else have a question that came on? I thought I saw maybe a question. No? Okay. 
Okay. All right. Well, thanks, Jen. Thank you so much. Oh, and she just great. dropped the website in the chat. So anybody who's interested, um, you can click on that. Oh, there we go. May 4th at 10 a.m. for the garlic mustard. <laughs> awesome. Thanks, that Laura, for checking that. Okay. Thanks again, Jen. Yes. Appreciate it. Hopefully everyone's going to make summer plans now to go visit. Mm -hmm. All right. Um, Laura, do you want to go through the um, our new members for this? Yeah. Um, so I saw a couple of you were on. So I think, Mindy, I saw you were on. Um, we're so glad you're here. I think you just joined uh, like today. So this is great that you were able wow. to. Um, yeah. yeah. And so okay. since our last meeting a month ago, we've had 11 members. Yeah. Mindy, do you want to say hi or? Like tell yeah, us. Yeah, I I wasn't ready before, but sure. No, that's um, okay. <laughs> I've been following you guys on on Facebook for a while. I'm a member of Keep Lakewood Beautiful in Lakewood, which has a lot of overlapping interests. So I'm just slowly but surely trying to work my yard into something more native. Awesome. Well, we're so glad to have you. Yeah. Um and reach out anytime if you have questions or wanting to connect to other things. Um, I think that we're planning on doing some events around that area this summer. So there's always stuff happening. I think a lot of, we have a lot of similar members and stuff. So mm -hmm. we'll have things in contact, I'm sure. Yeah, mm -hmm. that tracks. Um, so I know that this meeting is also open to Thank you, Jack. It was getting very dark in here. Um, uh, this uh, this meeting is also open to people who might not be members yet. So if you are interested in becoming a member, um, we have that QR code there. Um, if you have any questions before joining to become a member, please reach out to me um, or just our Wild Ones email. And uh, we can always tell you more about it and what we're up to. But really excited to have our new members and it's a good time to join because uh, we're about to have a lot happening. So I think that's all I got. Thanks, Laura. Yeah, we got lots of lots of stuff coming up. So it's a good time to um, to join us, um, especially which I'm jumping ahead. But, you know, one thing that membership helps us out with is being able to provide free uh, fun events for our members and non-members. Um, we just had a few, uh, this past month, which we'll get into here, but, um, you know, it, it's not just, you know, sending your money in and never seeing it. It's, it's helping us to, you know, give you guys this education and, um, events. So, um, we have the Habitat Corridor update um, if you are unaware, I'll give a quick synopsis the best I can. Um, so we've been working on the Northeast Ohio Native Habitat Corridor, um, which if you think, um, you know, birds, butterflies, being able to have those communities, uh, plant communities on your property and being able to then show other people and tell other people, hey, this is a plant community for that's benefiting um, wildlife habitat, pollinators, all that good stuff. Um, so we're planning, fingers crossed, to do a pre-launch party in April uh, and then having the actual launch Mother's Day weekend in May. Um, we are, we have them ordered. We have yard signs, um, this lovely graphic on the left-hand side. Um, is going to be a lovely metal uh, yard sign that you will be able to purchase and put in your yard once you have um, some habitat corridor plants. Uh, we will have a um, starter kit available at six local plant um, native plant nurseries around the area. So you'll get... Um, a whole pack of plants. I forget what the quantity is. Um, and you'll get a design Six. for, go ahead, Diane. Six. Six. Six plants. And you'll get a design if you get 
sun or shade versus what you have. Um, and then the sign will be uh, an extra purchase. Um, and we're also going to launch an interactive map. So if you join this, you'll be able to um, pin your property. So that way we can see where all the different um, properties are uh, to see how the corridor is forming throughout Northeast Ohio. Um, there's other communities doing this um, in kind that have already kicked off. So this is just kind of our way to expand this and what a better way to provide these native corridors for um, our, our natural wildlife here. Um, so hopefully we'll be able to see that grow in real time on the map, uh, which I'm pretty excited about. So again, if you have questions, always email us no matter what, no matter what the question is. If you just wanna say hi, you can always email us too. Um, <laughs> The Julie Slater, who uh, is kind of heading up our um, the native, this habitat corridor, created a Google group also um, to keep in touch with everyone that's listed on the bottom of the screen. Don't don't ask me any questions on the Google <laughs> group. I would assume if you type in that link, you can request to join and it should be pretty simple. Um, other than that, I am technologically unadvanced right now. <laughs> Still love you. Still love oh, you. Thank you. I gave up on trying to keep up with the Joneses, but it's fine. Um, <laughs> Diane, would you like to talk about our volunteer opportunities? Yes, of course, of course. Well, we still have a number of uh, different opportunities. Some of you who are not new members have seen this before. So I'm going to go through it super, super briefly. Um, we have a grant chair role, um, although I know Mary is on the on the call and she's been helping me a little bit with getting this started. So if you wanna become a grant chair uh, and help us not only continue to investigate opportunities, but to start applying for them as we grow as a chapter to uh, you know, do some projects uh, around the area. So let us know if you're interested in that. Uh, administrative support, this is kind of a miscellaneous role, meaning you can just help us with, uh, depending on your amount of time you have and what you're interested in doing with uh, going through our emails and helping keep us organized, helping us create, you know, or set up meetings or do communications, etc. cetera. Um, this can be, you know, a really small job uh, or, you know, up to whatever your interest level is. And that's pretty much true about all these roles as we go through. Uh, fundraiser chair. Um, this is just somebody that helps us over time to, you know, create fundraising campaigns and um, helps us, uh, you know, keep all the things that we, all the events and activities free and open to the public so that we don't have to just keep using our membership dues and funds like that, um, that, you know, are used for kind of maintaining the chapter. Communication chair, you know, we do a lot of communications to try to keep our members, you um, posted on things. So we probably go above and beyond there. And we, we could just use a little bit more help to, um, you know, put uh, professional plans together and uh, help us, you know, reach out to the community even more to spread the word about our mission. Next. Next one. Um, Keystone Workshop team, you all have heard about the Keystone Workshops, I think, unless you're a new member, but we're creating these standard um, educational programs that will be taught every year. And we have a team that's consolidating and creating and um, will and have already started with um, delivering uh, at least one program, which was the winter sewing. So we're moving on designing the rest of those and we can use helpers to design as well as to facilitate these workshops once they're, they're created. Uh, photography, you know, we love our photos and I'm the worst about this one. So I would never be a very good photography per chair, but I know a lot of you are into taking pictures. And so we would love to have you help us um, uh, coordinate uh, obtaining and taking photos so that we can use those for all different kinds of social media and communications. Um, 
tabling opportunities. This one's super hot right now. We've sent out some emails. We've gotten a lot of volunteers already, although we could use more because we um, maybe are over committing a little, um, but we haven't 100% committed to all the tabling opportunities that we'll talk about in a few minutes. But April and May so far, we have quite a number of events and we, we could use a few more. So if you don't mind uh, checking your emails and if you haven't gotten the email yet, you there will be more coming out to remind you and ask you if you can participate. We just got a recent one uh, that Sherry's going to be at, but we could use another uh, volunteer or two to go to Vermilion on April 6th. So uh, anyway, you'll see more information on that soon. Next slide. Events coordinator. Um, this is mostly busy during the spring and summer period when we have um, a lot of tabling events, but throughout the year, we need someone to just kind of keep us on track to uh, create that standard work and make sure that we have, um, you know, events that we have uh, aren't a lot of last minute kind of planning that we've actually prepared and done things ahead of time. So if you're organized and you like to, to help uh, work with it, work on a team to get these events coordinated, please contact us. Publicity, uh, we want to get the word out even more than we have. Um, somebody that is interested and has some experience in maybe working with the media, helping us to create some positive relationships, because if we can spread the word about what we're doing to, to the community, um, that'll just get more and more people that are, again, helping us meet our mission, which is just more, more native plants in the landscaping. Uh, so if if there's anything in this area that interests you, or even in helping any of us that have other jobs, like uh, Janice is the secretary, I'm the treasurer. If any of these areas are interesting to you, um, or you know, maybe you want to help with education, or maybe you could write a post here or there, you want to research something, or you found something out, um, you know, reach out. Send us an email, wildonesgreatercleveland at gmail.com. Thanks. Thanks, Diane. All right. So we had some recent events since our last chapter meeting in February. Um, the first was a winter sewing, um, one of our Keystone workshops that was at Lorraine uh, County Community College back on February 17th. Um, our VP, uh, Ray Stewart, who's not here, he's on vacation right now, was there. And then um, Danielle Squire, who's on this call. Um, she, Danielle, I apologize because I don't know your true title. Um, do you want to chat maybe just for a minute about how this event went? Oh, yeah, sure. So my title at the college is called the Specialty Gardens Coordinator. Um, it's just kind of a fancy way of just saying resident naturalist. Um, I really just kind of do a wide range of activities on campus, but I do specialize in the conservation of uh, outdoor spaces. But one thing I really love to do is um, give workshops because I get really, really excited and I just kind of explode with things that I have to share. And so I do that through workshop series. And so this was a really, really great way to bring our Wild Ones friends indoors. And it was a snowy day, so it was perfect. Um, and we just got our hands dirty, sowed a bunch of seeds, talked about a lot of things. Um, it was it was really a great time, really great space too, because it's a lab room. So there was all kinds of botanical and mammal and reptilian specimens all over the room, like really cool. Um, and it was really nice. We had a lot of follow-up of people just reaching out, wanting to stay in touch. A lot of uh, non-members of Wild Ones who were prepared to take the leap and learn more. So just in general, it was it was fantastic. That's great. Thanks, Danielle. I loved your description of how you like to uh, give the workshops. I feel I feel that burst of energy a lot too sometimes. <laughs> Um, we also had a seed and social um, at in the Medina uh, Parks District at the, and I'm going to say it wrong, Olin Slogger or Olin Slagger Nature Center. Um, one of our board members, Shelly Tender, uh, works at the Nature Center. And so she kindly uh, opened up 
um, her space for us to package some seeds. Um, Diane, do you have the total number? Do you remember that we pack yeah, packets that we? I think um, over fifteen hundred between Ray and um, my event and also the Medina one. Okay. This event we did seven hundred fifty. Okay. So, um, yeah, we got fancy and, uh, Shelly got some, uh, color envelopes. So it was, uh, mm -hmm. it was fun. And, um, again, it was, this was a very snowy day. So it was a really good, uh, exercise to do indoors and, uh, there was coffee and tea, so it worked great. Um, I think you can kind of see out the window. That was the day it just, it just kept coming down. Oh, and there were turkeys at the nature center. Yes. So the whole time we were sitting there, we watched the turkeys doing laps and it was like the best, it was the best thing. Mm -hmm. Great location. Yes. Yes. It was beautiful in the snow. Mm -hmm. um, and then my pride and joy, if anyone was at our social event that was just um, this past Tuesday, give a little wave. Um, we did, Julie and I uh, hosted our drink and design social up at Forest City Brewery in Ohio City um, Tuesday night to kind of ring in spring um, since it was spring equinox. And we had members, non-members um, send in either a photo of their home, their yard, or an aerial or had us research it. And we printed them out and brought them and brought trace paper and coloring utensils. And between myself and Julie, I think we must've had like a hundred books there <laughs> and resources for people to flip through. And we had about six experts walking around um, to help uh, people kind of chat through their yard, chat through their goals, um, see what plant material would work, what kind of design would work for them. Um, I think we had about 50 people, um, which Whoa. just blows my mind. Um, it was great. It was, it was busy, but it was, it was wonderful. So, um, if you did go, we're going to be sending out a post event survey just to see how, um, it went and how we can improve because we had such a good turnout that, um, we might do it again. So <laughs> keep an eye out for that. Um, spoiler alert, spoiler alert, spoiler alert. I don't know when I got to still recover from this week, but, um, I think I might sleep all weekend, hey, but, uh, we, we had a great time. What's that Laura? Real quick. It looks like Betsy, you have your hand raised. Did you have a question? She was there. Oh, I, met I was there. That's person. all I was saying. I'll take my hand down now. Oh, perfect. <laughs> oh, great. It was very exciting to see, um, you know, people that you've, I've been talking to and then it's like, oh, I get to see your face. So it was really nice. Mm. Um, all right. So we got some things coming up here. Um, we have another spring social, very informal, um, that Diane is graciously hosting at her home. Um, she has a few activities planned uh, if anyone's planning to attend. Uh, she is down um, in the Akron area in case anyone, you know, is free on Sunday and feels like taking a ride down to Diane's house uh, to hang out with us and talk about plants and possibly laminate things and um we'll keep you busy of other... <laughs> yes <laughs> it's a working social but it's a fun. working social yeah i like that yeah. um we're essentially getting ready for these tabling events that we're going to be doing um starting hot and heavy here in april so um just getting materials ready for uh going out in the public and spreading the word um and janice few... real quick i'm sorry yeah. no, um go ahead uh, we did put a registration out there. Um, it's on Facebook if you guys can register there. Um, just because I'm trying to get a count, I don't know how many people are going to be in my house. It's not that big of a house, but it's okay size. But I just want to make sure I'm prepared. So, no, that's a great uh, thing to bring up. Um, if you do not have Facebook, uh, you, here's here's this again. This mantra: you can just email us. Yes. Email, email and just say, hey, I plan to be at the social on Sunday at Diane's house. Count me in. That will work as well. Um, 
We have a few Habitat Corridor planning meetings coming up. Uh, those are on our website um, under events. The Zoom links are on there. They're virtual meetings. Um, there's one Sunday, the 24th, and one Monday uh, on April 1st. Um, so this is hot new news right off the press. Um, these events are going to go live this weekend. So you guys are getting a little bit of a preview. Um, we have been working on a spring ephemeral um, hike series. So uh, all these fun flowers that we were talking about in the beginning. Um, and don't be scared by the word hike. It's just, it's more like a stroll. We're going to stroll through the woods and look at spring ephemeral wildflowers and admire them and talk about how to ID them a little bit. Um, and we've picked places that have large varieties so that way we'll see lots of good stuff. Um, so Sunday um, in April 21st, we're going to be, uh, and we're co-hosting with all of these uh, different parks districts. So um, the April 21st is going to be with Medina County Parks District with Shelley. Um, Friday, uh, April 26th, we're going to be with Lorraine County Metro Parks up at the French Creek Reservation. Um, and then Sunday, April 28th, we're going to be with Summit Metro Parks at O'Neill Woods. Um, so put those on the calendar now. Um, get excited. <laughs> get your hiking boots <laughs> ready. Um, we're going to be out there. Like I said, these have not gone live yet. Um, they will be up this weekend and you can like and share on Facebook and Instagram and all the good things. Um, so we've been talking about hosting or uh, tabling at different events. So do not be scared by this list on the bottom. These are just events um, coming up that we will, you're gonna see us at. If, if, if you're not volunteering to table with us, that's fine. But this is a list of things so you can come out and see us, see all sorts of other environmentally friendly um, organizations uh, that are most likely going to be at these events. Um, another note on top of these, you know, a lot of these are um, pretty much all of these that are listed are <laughs> um, wrapped up with Earth Day, which is coming up. It's April 22nd. And so, you know, this is just our list, but keep an eye out for in your local community or the organization, other organizations that you follow and see what else is going on around town. Um, so we have the Vermilion River Watershed Open House, um, Medina County Earth Day Festival, Party for the Planet at the Akron Zoo, um, the Nestle Earth Day, that's a private event but uh, we'll be there. Um, the Lorain County Community College Earth Day and Plant Sale, which I think um, I saw Danielle mention in the uh, in the chat. Um, and then the Earth Fest at Adele Durbin Park that'll be uh, in Stowe. So we got a lot, a lot of tabling going on. <laughs> hey, yes. Jana, real yes. quick. There are a couple other requests that we had from some folks that are actually members as well. And we're still trying to work through those because as you see, there's, we've already had a lot of things that we'd already confirmed and then a yes. few more came in and we're going to see if we can commit to those. But, you know, I mean, we only have so many people and um, so much time, so I'm sure they will understand, but I just wanted to mention that, that this is just kind of the ones that we've confirmed and the rest are TBD. That's a good note. Um, yes, uh, in the chat, the Lakewood Earth Day. I believe we do have that one on the schedule, right, Diane? Um, Lakewood? I, that, I thought, Agnes, maybe you can come on. I can't remember if I confirmed or if I was, uh, um, I thought that was a, a maybe because we had already, we have a couple other dates here. Uh, yeah, that was, a, that was a maybe. That was just my cheap plug for anybody that wanted to join us. Okay, cool. No, that's right. great. That's great. Thank you. Thanks for coming on and clarifying. Absolutely. Anytime. Okay. All right. So it's about 8.01. 
Um, before we get into our last kind of group discussion here, does anybody have any questions on anything or comments or concerns? Hopefully not. No. Okay. So, um, Robin, if you would um, start us off on uh, what is nature in my backyard? Janice, I'm going to mention one other thing beforehand. I was fascinated <laughs> by the drink and design social. Um, I've been a professional landscape designer most of my adult life. Uh, and I obviously I'm also very concerned about native plants and things and you know evenings I tend to have a little bit of time so let me know about those because I can help with that too and that would be it. fun to do for me because you know daytimes we're constantly working on nature in my backyard <laughs> evenings I can usually find a little space I I would love that I know um, I don't know how I was able to rope, we were able to rope so many people in, uh, on the design side to help this time. Um, but I, you are definitely on my list now for, okay, good. for next time. So I appreciate you, uh, bringing that up. I, you know, we always, I don't know, we love having our, by we, I mean me, I, as a landscape <laughs> architect, love having more designers around. Um, you know, especially ones who are passionate about, you know, native, um, native plants. So we're glad you're here. It's always fun. It, it really is. So nature in my backyard, um, it's kind of a, um, the mini size version of wild ones. It's designed specifically for individual homeowners or renters who have gardens, or even, you know, little tiny balcony spaces or whatever it is. Um, we are a an accreditation program. Um, we offer a many step accreditation uh, certificate levels, um, starting with training people on how to recognize what non-native invasives are in their own gardens and then training them how to get rid of them and training them what to plant instead. And it's specifically designed for individual homes. And so we're not like in conflict with wild ones. We're trying to take the beginners and get them started so they're on their way to doing the more regional and more um, tied together activities. This is a program we started about a year ago. Um, there are, I think, six or seven of these now uh, running around the country that are run specifically through Audubon local chapters. And we are uh, run through the Audubon Society of Greater Cleveland with assistance from the Shaker Lakes Garden Club. Uh, but basically we cover pretty much all of the space that is covered by the Audubon Society of Greater Cleveland, which stretches out pretty widely. Although um, on the west side of Cleveland, they don't stretch very far. and We actually do more west side gardens as well. Um, I think, Janice, you have this form. If you could just put that up for a second. Yeah. Um, I kind of edited it down so I could get it on one good. screen. That's great. <laughs> um, this is uh, a draft version of the second year version, the big new improved version of um, our sign up sheets telling people, okay, step one, you know, here are the things you have to do for step one, you have to plant a tree. <laughs> That's the first thing, you have to plant a native tree. You don't have space for a tree, you have to plant some other native plants. Uh, but, you know, we take you through step by step. And at the end of the first set of steps, you get to put your little 
plants sign out in your front yard. And our sign is about the same size as your pollinator pathway sign, except ours is square. So you could put them on the same post if you wanted to. You know, they they look great together, <laughs> which would be wonderful. But anyway, how do you get the... um? Okay, the accreditation is basically you sign up on our website, um, which you will find uh, if you get one of these forms, we have the um, the doohickey that you can, the doohickey, that's, that's really good. <laughs> I love that word. You I can scan. The QR, the QR code. <laughs> QR code. Thank you very much um, that you can scan or you can just go to Audubon Society of Greater Cleveland, Nature in My Backyard, or you can Google Nature in My Backyard, Ohio. Make sure you put in Ohio because there is another one in Canada that's a different thing. But hmm. yeah, there we are. See, Audubon Society of Greater nice. Cleveland. Wasn't that handy? Oh, thank you very much. Um, Janice is really good at um, technology, even though she tries to act like she's not. Yeah, that's see, that would be hopeless for me. I mean, I I call the doohickey a doohickey, you know, um, whatever. <laughs> uh, but basically, there are various steps that we walk people through. And what we're trying to do is get people to the point where they are not only feeling much more comfortable about the native plants in their own yards, but also feeling that they can spread the word, that they can sign up on, um, on the Doug Tallamy website, and become a part of his worldwide uh, gardens, and just really, really feel that they're a part of the whole movement. And by then, you know, we happily pass them on to the bigger, better organizations. <laughs> they should all at that point go out and join Wild Ones, among other things. Um, but basically, we have found that most people are looking to us for two things. They're either looking for hold my hand and walk me through it, guidance, which I think most of you are probably past that point, um, or they're looking for how do I make this work and still have my yard look like it's not a mess. And so this is where the design aspect comes in. We do um, offer, it's not required for this, but we do offer free consultations um, coming to your home and we will walk around with you. We will identify the invasive plants that need to be removed and we'll give guidance on how to remove them, which is not something everybody knows automatically. Um, a lot of people don't want to go out there and say, I don't know what I have. I don't know what, I have this beautiful blooming bush in my backyard, but I don't know what it is. Well, you know, it's an invasive, non-native honeysuckle shrub and you need to get rid of it. <laughs> but we'll tell you what will do well in that location in your yard to take its place or to how to work that space into a full native area within the yard. That's the kind of thing that we're aiming to do is just to take people by the hand and bring them into the fold. And by the time we get them into being accredited, they're ready to run with it and they're ready to do a whole lot more. And so we're just trying to work for the people who aren't really comfortable with it yet and don't quite know how. <laughs> So that's what we're aiming at. Um, we do make a point of telling people that they don't have to pull out all of grandma's favorite peonies and everything else, which, I mean, I love peonies. I have peonies. 
not a problem. On the other hand, if you do have shrub honeysuckles, that is a problem. They got to go. And we'll let you know when it's something that really has to go. And it really has to go now. Burning bush. Oh, my God. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> don't even start. But um, we'll <laughs> explain to people what that is all about. The other thing that we have at our website, and if you go there, you'll see is a fairly tightly collated um, group of resources. Uh, a lot of books, um, but just the the ones that are, you know, at the center of this discussion. I mean, I I think I have an entire room papered in landscaping books because I've been in the business so long. But you know, we just point to the ones that are necessary for this. Um, a number of uh, specifically native plant nurseries at native plant uh, seed sources, and also sources that are mail order for native plants, um, which obviously you don't recommend as much because you want something with um, a more localized source. Uh, but if you can't get that, you know, you can, go to Izel Plants and they'll give you eight different sources for that same plant, some of which are going to be closer to you, um, whatever, things like that. Uh, we try to make that available. So if any of you know, I mean, we certainly have Julie's um, uh, group on our website, but if you know of really fine, um, trustworthy native plant sources in the area, that aren't on our website, we would love to hear about them because we check everything out pretty thoroughly before we put it up. So if you think you've got a really good idea, please just let me know. I'm the one in charge of that. Um, and you can write to me at Nature in My Backyard um, and at the Audubon Society and you'll get me. So what else do you want to know? Ask questions, please. That all before we ask any questions or chat about this, um, I guess I personally did not know about everything you guys do. And that oh, yeah. is amazing. Um, there's a couple people in the chat saying how much, you know, how great it is that you guys go out to people's houses. Like, do you have, is it volunteer based? It is, is volunteer it? based. Okay. It, it is definitely volunteer based. Um, uh, questions just came up from Mary about how does this fit with Homegrown National Park. Um, I actually, uh, I mentioned that just because I think everyone should join Homegrown National Park. And what we do is we try to encourage pretty much exactly the behavior that Doug Tallamy tries to encourage. Up to 70 or at least 70% as a final target goal of all of the volume of plants on your property should be native plants. Now that includes your lawn, boo hiss. Let's all remember that there are no actual grasses that are native to North America. There are other graminous plants, graminous plants, but there are no grasses. So lawn grass, mm, boo hits. Uh, but, you know, <laughs> lots of people like, I mean, they've got kids, they want to play in it. The dogs have to run on something. So, you know, what you have to do is balance that out by having many big oak trees because oak trees, I mean, there you go. There's volume for you, you know, and plant your gardens primarily with natives. So that's that's kind of what we're aiming at. Um, so, uh, Danielle, I'll be right. Oh, thank you, Danielle. <laughs> That's great. <laughs> What's your address? <laughs> Love that. What's your phone number? <laughs> um, we've also gotten the, um, the, the, uh, Master Gardeners of Cuyahoga County on board. They are offering, um, uh, educational credit to their members 
for doing the educational training that we do to train our volunteers. And then for those who want to go ahead and also be part of the consultation team, they'll get uh, volunteer hours for those as well. So, you know, we're trying to bring in knowledgeable people and train them further so that they know where they're going um, with this. So more questions. Good question. Robin, what's the what's the number one thing you think that people, when you go make these visits, what's the number one thing like that people have a hard time with or or a big question about or are confused about? You know, what's their the thing? Um, um, the number one thing they have trouble with is they're looking at the sheer volume of stuff that they need to get rid of. They're looking at their masses of English ivy. They're looking at their masses of privet. Um, sometimes they have intentionally, oh God, planted privet hedges and planted English ivy and other such lovely, charming plants. And it is very hard for them to say, okay, I promise I will get rid of this. You know, as I say, we're not asking them to get rid of everything, but the worst invasives have to go. That's a, a hard stop. And what they need is to, I mean, a lot of people have privet and don't realize they have privet. They don't know what that is. It's that nice smelling green hedge that that's, has been there for a million years. That's what I immediately thought of is you said the honeysuckle and my mind went to privet. <laughs> like, oh, and it like suckers. I just wrote eyes. an article on um, invasive shrub honeysuckles. So that one was on the top it's of on your head. It's on your brain. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, um, that's, that's really the biggest issue is that people see just the volume of stuff that we're asking them to do. And the thing is, what we try to do is provide a step-by-step. -step. For example, um, I met a nice lady over the winter who has redone her entire front yard entirely in native plantings, except she has some peonies because she likes peonies. Well, I don't have a problem with that. She has a hedge between her house and the neighbor, and it is a burning bush hedge. And she said, you know, I can't replace all of that in one year. Well, of course not. So we'll sit down with you and we'll say, okay, do you want to have a mixed hedge or do you want to have a uniform hedge? And if you want to have a mixed hedge, let's suggest that you take out every fourth plant right now of your burning bush and mm -hmm. plant one good variety repeated in those spaces. Then the next year, you take out every second burning bush and you put a different variety in and of, of a good native. And you go on like that. And we would, you know, depending on the, the site and the conditions, make different recommendations for what kind of plants would work well. But yeah, I mean, here are people saying it's a big job. Absolutely, it's horrible. And English ivy, I mean, that's that's got to be the worst, you know, yeah. because it's all up in your trees. It will strangle trees. It will kill trees. Um, and that's a horrible, horrible, horrible thing to have happen. But one at a time, well, a winter creeper is not actually worse, Kathleen, because it's not something that everybody plants. Everybody plants English ivy. Not everybody plants winter creeper, but yes, it's the same thing. It it will kill your trees. It will strangle your trees. It will take over your spaces. It will absolutely cover the ground and any good plants that you have there, either one of those plants and a whole lot of other ones like them are going to be choked out and disappear. So yeah, it's it's a really hard job. But what we try to do is come up with the best methods for you and a schedule over years that you can follow to get there. Yeah, trying to get rid of the ivy for years, that's just it. It takes forever. 
I moved here in 2006. I am still pulling out little stragglers of English ivy. This is killing me. You know, between the English ivy and the gout weed, <laughs> I oh, thought I was going to die when I moved here. <laughs> but I haven't. Most of it has, but not all of it. Gout yeah. weed will keep coming back forever. Does anybody else have any questions or comments? I, I'm just curious. The big garden centers, you know, we hear and see their advertisements and on the news every year around this time. Do you see that, are there any of these garden centers coming around to um, at least uh, providing some native plants? They do provide some native plants for the most part. And this is something I ask all of you and all of your friends, please, to be aware of is a lot of them don't know if the plants they're selling have been treated with neonicotinoids. If they've been treated with neonics, they're going to kill your pollinators. One seed with a neonic coating is enough to kill a songbird. You have to be very careful whether things have been treated or not, whether they've what been is... grown from coated seeds or not. And if they have, don't buy them there. So one thing that I do tell our clients, those who are willing to do it, <laughs> is that when they go to buy their plants, they should ask specifically, are these plants treated in any way with neonicotinoids? Because if they are, I will not buy from you. And if you don't know, I wanna to speak to your manager. And if your manager doesn't know, I will not buy from you. And then make sure all of your friends know that. That's a problem. Robin, what are the what are the neonics? What is that? Oh, what are um, neonicotinoids for? are um they're chemicals that are designed to be taken up um through all of the the pieces and parts of a plant and they make it poisonous to our pollinators they make it poisonous to um to insects but what why do they put it on the plant what does it benefit oh them? they use it on the plants because that way when they go to sell something nobody's been chewing on the leaves it looks all fresh and wonderful um and so it's essentially like what when you go to the grocery store and you look at like an organic orange compared to non and it looks like funky and a weird shape kind of thing. Yeah, exactly. Okay. <laughs> um, but the problem is that that weird orange is probably not going to kill you. Right. But that weird plant. And it tastes is, just the same. <laughs> yeah. And yeah. the weird plant is going to kill the birds and the bees in your yard. And Interesting. That's what we need to watch out for. Okay, that's a good that's a good tip. Yeah, yeah really quick, Robin, wasn't there um a study that somebody did last year of common milkweed on the neonics on uh, different companies that a lot of yeah a lot of companies are milkweed? now they're they're saying oh boy we're selling native plants isn't this great but they're treating them if they're yeah. treated with neonics they're just killing the plants that you're trying to use so that your insects, your pollinators can survive. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's it's absurd, which is why you really have to learn to ask. And that's why when we list nurseries on our website, we only list nurseries that only sell natives and that are very specific about the fact that their plants are not treated. Um, and that's what we all need to get to doing. I, you know, I hate to say it, but if you go to, as I do sometimes, I go to Bremex, you know, which is one of the biggies here on the east side. But I know what I'm buying when I go to Bremex. And there are certain things that I don't buy from them. Um, I just, I won't. Because I know what I'm going to be facing. And so you're better off Buying from Julie Slater <laughs> or anyone That's else. A great Slater. plug. <laughs> yeah, big plug, big plug. 
<laughs> or I, um, I have ahead, a Matt. I have a question. How lo how long do the neonics stay in the plant? Do um, they sort of, do they stay in there for like a year? Yeah, or... it, it'll be a full growth cycle. Okay. In, in perennials, and and annuals, of course, you know that's the entire life of the plant. So it's an issue that way. And I know I've met with people. Uh, who have seed companies um, and they use these wonderful coatings that, that keep the plants from, from the seeds from, um, from dying off before they're sown. And then they provide all sorts of good food for the seeds when the seeds are first sown. But a lot of them also have, unfortunately, hidden killers in them man yeah. and it's I just know. hard sorry matt go ahead oh no no I, I i was just gonna say it may or may not you know people in this group may or may not be at your regular store buying milkweed but i i know one of the things with milkweed is if you see aphids on the milkweed in the store you're good <laughs> yep the safe because yeah. otherwise they'd be dead <laughs> right yeah, that's a good point. In the interest of time, does anyone else have any other questions or comments? Thank you so much, Robin. This was, this is great. And I like that you said in the beginning, it's almost, it's like complimentary to what we do. I like that, um, you know, that the Nature in My Backyard program is really taking those beginners and giving them the building blocks and, you know, like taking small bites out of a big project and, you know, helping to move it forward. So I think that's, that's great. And I think, um, at least myself, I'll be promoting you guys, um, to anyone who might be asking about things like that. Yeah. Sherry, did you want to say something? Oh, no, I didn't. Okay. I left to call. Sorry. <laughs> no, it's okay. I thought I'd say you wave. All right. Um, so thank you, Robin, so much. And I'll uh I'll definitely be in contact about the the design. Um yeah, that'll be fun. And then just, you know, we'll see you, we'll see you next month um on April 18th for our next meeting. Um obviously we'll be we'll be around town a lot coming up for uh Earth Day events. So Keep an eye out on our website. We're going to list all of the events that we're tabling at there. Um, and then it's also just a good list. So if you want to get out and see some of these um, festivals and events, you can bum around town and check them out. Um, I have to say, like us on social media, share us with your friends, <laughs> um, become a member. We're cool. We're awesome. We want to talk about plants with you. So thanks everybody for being here and um, have a great rest of your week. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Thanks. Good night.